This is Larry the Barber Man, and today I am in Milton Keynes at the Braid Barber Shop with the two Braid Brothers, which are co owners of this award winning barber shop. I'm here today just to have an informal catch up in a conversational manner with these two guys to find out their story. They're doing big things. As I said, they're award winning. Uh, Robert is an exceptional uh, photographer making big waves within the fashion and barbering industry at the same time. So I'm just here to find out their story. So guys, as I said, um, you've got an interesting story to tell. Very keen to find out how you made your way into barbering. As I understand, it was originally a, a full family business and now it's been taken over by your good self. So I'm really keen to hear your story. Dad started the, with hairdressing 40 years ago. Um, he had five shops at his peak, uh, one of which was in Bond Street, a uh, couple in Birmingham, um, uh, Northampton and Milton Keynes. Um, we, he, how many years, about 30, 40, about 30 years ago, started the barbers in the Milton Keynes shop, which we um, later came into, I came into it about 22 years ago. You came into it, what, 25? Yeah. 25 years ago. Um, we both originally started it with hairdressing. Um, I, through my own sort of shyness, had a bit of a fear of dealing with women's hair. It was a slight nervousness on my part. So I went into the barbering side. But men, men's barbering wasn't that interesting, actually, um, when we first started. Um, when we first started out, um, Quite basic, wasn't it? it was yeah, it was just all French crops, um, flat tops, um, and it, it just wasn't that interesting. It was um, so that's you know I found hairdressing a lot more interesting. Um, but but you you uh, sort of went into it, didn't you? Yeah, I went into it out of fear of, of dealing with women and stuff. But then I found that I just came to love it. I started I started. Cutting hair, I got thrown in by Dad in the, in the deep end, and uh, I just found after a few days that I started to get customers, you know, I just loved it. And then uh, customers start asking for you, and before you know it, you're just buzzing every day. Yeah. And then, uh, so you carried on hairdressing, didn't you? Yeah, I carried on, I carried on hairdressing, um, and then uh, we opened a cafe, actually, in our Milton Keynes shop. Um, which we, we had for a while and then I, I sort of helped run the cafe which I found very difficult. Um, it was a, a lot of uh, after hour work and before we opened the shop uh, I had to come in and prepare sandwiches and, and things like that. Um, but then I wanted to go off travelling um, and I went off to Asia for a couple of years uh, and David carried on uh, running the shop whilst I was away? Well, I carried on running things and things just got more and more interesting in the barbering world. Uh, the haircuts got so much more interesting. People like Beckham came on the scene, started making waves, uh, customers coming in asking for Beckham styles and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it, just, it just really started to kick off. And then Rob, by the time Rob came back, all these like, little patterns and different bits and bobs started going on in the hair. Um, I m remember um, watching the World Cup 2002 in, in Thailand. I think it was 2002, I might be wrong. Um, and Beckham came out onto the pitch and he had a, he had a line in his head. And I thought, oh, that's, that's something different. Um, I, like, I like the look of that. Um, and when I came back from traveling, uh, I wanted to get into kind of like the, uh, the pattern pattern side of things and that's when we um, opened our bamboo shop wasn't it? Yeah. How long ago was that bamboo shop? About 16 years, 17 About 16 years. 16 years ago. So the bamboo shop was your first ever shop that you uh, yeah. owned together? Yeah. Off, yeah, off your own yeah. accord? Well we, we, managed, yeah, we managed a dad shop for a while, David managed it while I was, while I was, whilst I was away and when, when I came back, um, like, like we said, men's barbering was had become a lot more interesting. So um, we decided to go and open our own barber shop 
and it was Banbury. Um, we actually we were looking at Leamington, but never found a, a shop with a good position. Um, but I, I, I ended up in Leamington on the way to Warwick. I drove through Leamington on the way to Warwick and thought this is just a beautiful town. Yeah. I thought if there's ever a shop comes up here, once we've got Banbury up and running, we'll come back. Yeah. So once, once Banbury was up and running and sort of doing its thing, we, uh, I, I carried on scouting around and found the, the shop that we've got now, which we've had for about 10 years. Yeah. Tell me, um, this question's more directed at David, as I know that you kind of take care of the uh, interior design, and I have to compliment you on your uh, design. It's, you know, my kind of barbershop, the Larry the Barberman's kind of barbershop. Tell me your thinking when you kind of designed this shop. Because funny enough, I was talking to David at Rob last night and he was, I thought it was kind of Rob had influence from kind of Vanity Fair. And when he said, you designed the shop, then I thought straight away, wallpaper. This kind of reminds me of the wallpaper magazine. Tell me what you was thinking when you designed the shop. Well, I mean, first... First, we sort of we found the shop, and then you, and then you kind of work from there. But it's it's sort of I don't know what it takes me about twelve to eighteen months to to get together the furniture. I sort of drive around the country, going to antique auctions, antique shops, uh, vintage shops, places like uh, Spitterfields, uh, Brick Lane. Um, I've had a lot of influence from art, different artists, street artists, that sort of stuff, um, and I just. It takes me about 12 months to 18 months to collect the furniture. I, I generally fill my house up with random bits of furniture, like, like the uh, York Museum piece behind there, which really doesn't fit in a house very well. But I sort of suffer it until the point where we get a shop, and then, and then I gradually put it in, and then I try and work the shop around some key pieces, the bits that I love. I think for me, it's all about, it's all about love for the piece. It's all about the thing that I like now at the moment is is how sort of textural everything is how how age i mean you, you can't you can't buy the life of furniture you can't just go and buy like a sort of chinese or indian remake of furniture that looks as good as original sort of solid mahogany pieces that have had 50 to 100 years just sitting there being touched and felt each, each piece has a story behind it there doesn't it yeah i mean yeah no, I, I, I like I like a story behind it. I like you know the medis medicinal cabinets, you know the York Museum piece. I, I had to have this made. Original original uh, uh, cinema, cinema seats, seats when they were called theatre. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you just sort of I don't know. You just sort of walk around and sometimes I buy things just not knowing if they're going to work, but I, I love them. So I sort of take them home, stick them in my house, live with them for a bit. And then, and then bring them into the shop. And then just try and work, work them in somehow. You've done a very good job. Thanks. And this shop actually won an award for Best Barbershop. Tell me a little bit about that award directed at Robert. Right, well, actually, we didn't, we didn't know we'd been nominated for this award. And we've got um, uh, someone that helps us with our marketing who lives in LA. Uh, we can't keep up with all the emails and you know everything that, that goes on. So he, he kind of checks our emails for us, um, and he said, "Oh, just to let you know, uh, you've been nominated for an award." Um, and we're like, "Really?" I said, like, "Okay." Um, so next thing is they they, they I, I got in touch with the uh, hair I think it's English Hair and Beauty Awards, um, and I said, "You know, what do you do? You need anything from us?" And they said, "Can you?" Can you send like some of your work and a bit of history about you? So I sent I sent our work, um, and then the next thing is we, we 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 actually tried to get to the awards, but we got stuck in traffic, uh, couldn't get there. Um, so we we thought by the time we get there, we'll be halfway through it, and we thought, well, probably not going to win anyway. And we turned around, went back, had a Sunday roast and, and a beer. Um, and then we called the, the lady that had organised it. To apologise. To apologise. <laughs> by the way, how, how are we getting on? And she said, oh, you've won... Uh, your regional. The re you, you've won your regional. And we're like, really? OK, fantastic. And then we called her at the end of the evening. She said, oh, by the way, I'd just like to let you know that you've, you, you've won the whole thing. And we're, 
it was just amazing. Um, I think it was all um, sort of to do with social media, um, uh, reviews, uh, you know, anything to do with social media, basically. Um, but amazing. Yeah, we've actually uh, been nominated, both David and I have been nominated for men's hairstylists separately, and also the barbershops nominated again. So, see what happens. And to you, David, as you're kind of like the man that creates the working environment and the home for service, tell me what is different about Braid's shop in Milton Keynes in particular, because I've interviewed, oh, Tony at Just for Gents, I've interviewed uh, Gregory Mack at Gregory Max. What separates you from them guys, in your opinion? Oh, um... I, think. I, d I don't know. We don't really. St we, we we try not to compare ourselves. I mean, I, I don't. I, I I don't really look at sort of what people in my vicinity sort of do. I just kind of. I don't know. I just. I, I like. I like to keep my head down and do what I love. I you know when it, when I'm designing a shop, I take I take inspiration from, from bars, from from uh, museums, from art galleries, stuff like that. And I, I don't know. I just. I just, I just try not to be influenced by other people and I just sort of try and do my own thing. You sort of go with, fa you go with the styles, um, you know, you look around and go with, with general style, but I, I would say I get more, on, on interior design, I get more, more sort of inspiration from bars around the world. Okay, let's talk more about the service that you provide to your clients and maybe the hairstyles that they would come here for. I, I think uh, I think Pete, I think we get a complete range and a complete mix. I think because this shop's quite uh, homely, um, I think uh, a lot of people like to come in here and they feel like they can relax um, with with the kind of hairstyles. I mean, it, we we literally it's a complete mix. I, I, I you know um, I wouldn't like to compare us to Gregory Max or Just Gents. I I, I, I think we all do. A bit of everything. Um, I think the only thing that really sets us apart, really, is perhaps the way that the shop's designed. Um, you know, it's got a comfortable feeling about it. And I think people like to, you know, even if they've got to wait 30, 40 minutes, they feel like they can sit here and relax, um, which is a which is a good thing. Um, and then I think with um, our projection of of this, the work that we do on social media, I think that helps. Um, that's, that's kind of put us on the map a lot. So I think people come to us for like, you know, the next new style or the latest style. Um, it's interesting how it works with social media because it brings around like a, a whole new, it seems to bring around, it doesn't necessarily always affect the general area, does it? It doesn't, I think it, it puts you out on more of a world stage. It's, it's just really interesting. I mean, for me, being the one that doesn't really like to get out there so much. I'm, I'm like the sneaky one in the background. Um, it's just been an eye-opener. I mean, I never, I never thought that, that, that there's these other sides of the business were so attainable. I mean, it's through him. I mean, I just do what I love, which is the interior. I just go around the country buying stuff and, and putting things you together. Love, but you, you love cutting hair. And you I love cutting hair. I love you cutting love hair. the banter. I just like, I love the customers. I mean, we're, we're sort of so fortunate that we get such a broad sc scope of customers. We get young, old, and, you know, I don't know, I think, I think we're just really lucky. I think the customers we get just make it, the customers for me make my day. I mean, through, through social media, through social media, we've, I've, I've actually had two clients come from America to have the haircut, um, which was... That I can see. Which was incredible. Um, we, we, Funny enough, we had one guy that came from America to get a haircut um, of a model he'd seen on our page. And when he came into the shop, the actual model was in here. So he was like, wow, as if, you know, I'm, I'm here at Braids. Uh, I want this guy's haircut and the model's here standing in front of me. He was like, you know, amazed. Um, the funny thing with it is, is, is all the people that you've used for models were all customers in the first place yeah this is this is just ro you I mean Rob just sees it you know you'll be just chopping someone's hair you'll be cutting someone's hair in the chat and Rob will just come over and say this guy's he's, 
it, you know, his face is going to work for photos. I mean, I can't see it. I can't take a photo for Toffee. He can't, he, can't do a, he can't do a room out for Toffee by himself. And I can't take... I mean, you stick a camera in my hand, I'll make the most beautiful scene look terrible. <laughs> I mean, as, as far as, like, a basic sunset goes, I think, I'm, I, you know, I could even make that look awful. Whereas, whereas he makes the most... What about the pictures you took of uh, your girlfriend on holiday? <laughs> you couldn't see her. Couldn't see her in a single photo that I took. She was in too far away when she was in... In a, sh in a shadow. <laughs> I'm not in the shadow, you was exposing for the, the sky. And if yeah. you're exposed for yeah. the sky, then she's going to be black. You took, you took one picture of her and you saw more of the bus than... than uh, well, as I took the photo, the bus just went straight in front of her. <laughs> and then she gave up in the end. So that's, yeah, I'm, I'm completely skillless and talentless where it came to photos. And the interesting thing was, is, you know, I think, I think you, you get extremely into things, don't you? And obviously, before it was always music, and I always thought that um, I, I, I would have invested into some, something to do with music with Rob, because um, his music was awesome. Um, but then when he came back from travelling, I saw, I saw his photos. I mean, you took a, like a film, is it an SLR? Like a standard camera with a film in it. He, he went travelling for two, two, nearly three years, I think, in the end. It came back with a backpack full of rolls of film and I'm not one for, for particularly lo looking at other people's holiday or wedding photos, it's not really my bag, but he kind of forced me to sit down with him over a beer and look at some of his photos and, uh, and it, it was, they were just breathtaking. So from that moment, aside from the music, the one thing I thought, I, you know, Rob should do more with photography. So in the end for Christmas, I think it was your Christmas and your birthday present, I, uh, I bought him a DSLR and uh, just said, you know, just, you know, enjoy. And the next thing is, he was on social media. And I was like, wow, they're, they're amazing. Where have they come from? Who's this customer? It took me a long time before I started using it for social media, though. Yeah. yeah. And the funny thing is, now when we're out for a beer discussing business, we'll, we'll be mid-flow of talking about bills and the usual sort of trappings of running a business, the painful side of it. And, uh, and Rob, Rob will just interject, say, hang on, hang on a second, there's a guy over there that's just got an amazing face. And he'll just go and chat to someone in a bar and he'll be like, you need, you need to come in to get some haircuts. So I mean, you, you actually said that it's just unbelievable how you find yourself look, just looking at men all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just finds himself looking at men and thinking, God, he's going to be amazing. The next thing is he, he toddles off. He like, you can't even get a conversation out of him. He'll just run off and... Answered my, my two questions that I was going to ask you on where Rob actually started and where he gets his influence. So thank you for that, David. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry, it's good, it's good. <laughs> so let's, let me introduce the photography now. I mean, you take stunning images that I believe have been on a couple of front covers. Yeah. Most of your work looking around your shop is magazine worthy. So we kind of know where you started. We kind of know how you headhunt. Tell me where you get your kind of influence for the photography. Do you have storyboards or do you just work randomly off the top of your head? Okay, so when I went travelling, um, there was no Facebook, um, there was no um, social media at that point. It was all film. Um, you know, it was the time where you used to send postcards back home. You couldn't just ring home. Um, so I wanted to document my experience, um, take pictures. But what I found fascinating, rather than taking pictures of landscapes and buildings and things like that, I wanted to take pictures of people, people being natural, because their, 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 their lifestyles are completely different to ours. Um, so I, I started taking pictures of people, and, and I found it really fascinating uh, trying to capture people being natural. Um, because the second you put a camera in some, some of these people's faces, they just freeze. Well, that was it. Or just got like that. That was you know. that was the interesting thing you were saying about the difference between kids, because a lot of, a lot of the photos you took of kids and stuff were yeah. were amazing. But um, when I was in Mongolia, um, I, they they they'd, ne they'd never seen cameras before, um, so I used to say, you know, can I take a picture? And they would just go. They they thought that a camera was sort of taking away their sort of spirit or something. So. I literally had to try and catch them before they knew I was taking pictures of them and I got the most incredible pictures um, of the Mongolian people. 
Um, so I've got a lot of practice, because I was traveling on and off for two or three years, um, just taking pictures of people. And when I came back, obviously I don't find our culture that interesting because I live here. But um, I started, I, I, had, I had my first child, um, and then I started taking pictures of my children. And I wanted, you know, to document them growing up. And with kids, um, you know, you have to kind of uh, capture them, um, but because they're constantly moving, you know, you kind of had to kind of chase them around a bit. Um, yeah, but then you get that, once you get that shot, it's absolutely magical. And it made me realize that, um, you know, the sort of photography I do now is I, I try and capture people I try, I try and capture them naturally. So there's obviously a point where you're taking pictures of them and they know that they're having to pose, but I don't want it to look like they're posing. So um, that's, that's my thing now, is, is, is not just taking pictures of the haircuts, it's, um, it's, it's trying to capture that person, the, the essence of that person, um, the style, their look, you know, ev everything about them and I think I think that's where I, no, that's why my photography is slightly uh, different. Um, I, when I first started social media, I have to say my biggest influence was Scorum. Um, I someone showed me some of their work, and I was like, "Oh, that's amazing!" Um, and what I liked about them is they were taking pictures of their own uh, customers, and and they were actually sending out posters of their work. And they were normal people as well, weren't they? Yeah, it um, wasn't. It wasn't like a GQ top model. It was, it was just, yeah, just a, a guy with a flat amazing. top. And then, you know, yeah, just people with character and something different about them. And I thought, oh, that's amazing. I, I want to take, I want to take pictures of, 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 of our clients, uh, and I want to create our own, our own kind of theme, um, and have our own pictures on the wall, have our own posters. Um, I originally bought loads of art for in, in here. I bought loads yeah. of street art. I, I, start, I brought it all, brought it all in. Rob was like, no, we're not doing that. We're, put, we're putting the, the, you know, the, uh, the customers on the wall. Rob's work. Rob's work. <laughs> so I'm, I've now got a dining room full of art, full of it. I've got nowhere to put it. I, can't, I don't dare put it on the wall because I can't line it up. OK, so like I said, your work is exceptional uh, through my eyes barbering, the prestige and the kudos associated with barbering is rising. So I think it's going to get to a point where barbers will be right up there with, you know, the likes of the Fellowship and HJ. So barbers will need to produce images of this quality. Now, with the growth of social media and mobile telephones, there's a lot of barbers out there taking shots on their mobile telephone and thinking that this is worthy of taking the game to the next level. I don't believe that to be the case. You're one of the few barbers that creates uh, images that are worthy of HJ or some of these high fashion magazines. When are you two guys going to create a photography course for these barbers to bring their skill set level up. Yeah, it, it is actually something I've thought about um, and um, myself and David are, 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 are discussing. Uh, I think we, we're just continuously busy at the moment, so it's kind of like... It's so, it's, so, it's so tough running a business, doing... We're just trying to find the right... You know, we've got a few things in the pipe, we've got a few things in the pipeline, a few things that we're kind of pursuing at the moment. Um, and, but at some point, we would definitely uh, consider doing a course um, where uh, they can get... You know, we'll teach them our way, cutting, um, and then, you know, teach how to kind of... what to look for when you're taking a picture. Um, especially when you're cutting, um, and then yeah, show them how to take a picture. What I what I find find interesting is I wasn't actually that passionate about cutting for a long time, and it, I was more passionate about photography. And it was through the photography that I got passionate about cutting. So when I looked at a person, I wanted to create something that would, I could take a picture of. So. 
sometimes I'd do a haircut, I'd take a picture of it and the haircut wasn't good enough. So then that made me up my game with my cutting because I knew that when I was cutting the hair, I had to, uh, you know, you cut, because you've, no you've got the shadows to think about, you know, you could do the, the perfect fade in here, but then you take them outside, it looks completely different. So actually photography has helped me improve my cutting. It's like, it's like looking at your it's haircut good. through a different eye. It's, it, it gives you a different, different I view. I look at the haircuts as if I'm looking at it through the lens. Yeah, no, definitely, because basically in photography, what you have to do is turn the three-dimensional and make the three-dimensional look good in two-dimensional. So that's your thinking, yeah. in my eyes anyway. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. I'm sure I'm not. Right, guys, so we spoke a lot about the industry. We've spoken a lot about your shop, your photography work. Outside of all of these things, I have heard, Rob, that you was a one-time martial arts stick champion. I'm keen to know about this experience. Actually, both of you are into martial arts, but I've heard that about you. Tell me about this, sir. Uh... Right, so um, when I went traveling, I, uh, I started doing uh, f like fire shows. Um, so I was doing like, um, like they're called Thai poise. They, they originate from New Zealand, where you kind of uh, spin fire around. And then you've got the staffs uh, where you set the, the staffs on fire and you spin them around. And when I, kept, when I came back from travelling, um, I kind of wanted something to do. And uh, I heard that there was a, a Bruce Lee kind of uh, martial arts place in, in Northampton. Um, and I just wanted something to do. So I, I went along and because I had all this kind of experience with the, the Thai poise and the, the, the sticks, I kind of uh, took to it really quickly, um, but I was just doing it for a bit of fun. And then my, my teacher said, uh, you know, you should enter in a few competitions. And I thought, oh no, no, I don't want to do that. But I did it anyway for experience. Um, uh, I had a couple of competitions and a, a British championship. I uh, got, I think it was uh, a bronze medal and they picked, they picked me along with a, a team to go to the World Championships in the Philippines. And I thought, oh, it'd be a great experience. I, I wanna go to the Philippines because I spent a lot of time in Asia. I'd love to go to the Philippines. I thought I'm never gonna win, you know, just, just go along anyway for a bit of fun. Um, training was amazing, it was really hard. We trained for about four months. Um, went along, uh, it was really, scared uh, and I thought I just want to get one win under my belt then you know I'll, I'll be happy and just kept winning um, and then yeah won the world championship uh, and I was like I can't believe it um, floating he came back floating yeah um, and then yeah so I just ca carried it on um, my brother is uh, David Devils as well yeah. yeah, I just I I mainly do JKD Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. You do um, which one? Jeet Kune Do. Bruce is Bruce Lee's art. It's the one that he. Oh, is that a little bit like Wing Chun? Uh, well, it has it has Wing Chun, like it has a hint of Wing Chun with along with fencing. Um, it was basically um, it's it's more JKD is more of a philosophy applied, body mechanics that kind of stuff. People try and compare it to MMA and that sort of stuff, but it's. They say it's the original MMA, but it isn't really because it's not a sport art, it's a sort of street fighting art. So it's more about finishing it, not about point scoring. Okay, so if someone came in this shop, they could come unstuck. It's a good <laughs> thing they haven't got the traditional uh, old barber poles in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're working on being an instructor, aren't you, Dave? And, well, you no, I'm not. Well, I'm not trying to be an instructor. Be I'm just doing doing what I enjoy doing. I'm just yeah. doing is what it, I enjoy. Is it doing. Good stress. Stress release. When you have a bad day at work, you just go and smash the crap out of some pads and headbutt, <laughs> headbutt some motorbike helmets with people inside and um, <laughs> throw some elbows about, do some groin kicks and eye, eye gouges. Okay, let's, let's, let's move back on to barbering. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk, right, so what I'm keen to know is what are, on a positive note, what are you loving about the industry right now, just in closing? Um, what I love about the industry... Vibrance. 
yeah, I just, I just love the way it's kind of exploded, um, um, and people are getting chance to kind of express themselves and 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 and, and show their, their their pride for what they do to the world, um, and then people, you know, and it's and it's and it's brought the kind of barbering and the the hair world. It's brought everyone together. Um, I've made so many friends uh, f through uh, the industry. Um, in America and all over the world, actually. Um, so I, I love it for that. Um, I think it brings out the best, you know, the creativity in people, uh, being able to share it with people. Yeah, the passion. It, it, it's like it's passionate. It, you feel, you feel like, um, I don't know, it's like people appreciate it more. It's like people want that creativity now. It used to be a bit sort of stayed, a little bit, you know, all, I think men had more fear back in the day, you know, when I first started, people were afraid of, 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 of doing anything out of the ordinary. I think now people, people want it, they, they get excited about it. I mean, you know, some of the stuff that Rob does now, it's like, you know, and, and, and all these customers, all these people are, are just customers. They're customers that come in and Rob, Rob mentions something to them and, and they go for it, don't they? But yeah, I, I like the fact that, you know, it, we can all inspire each other. You know, I'll, I'll see a cut that uh, another barber or, uh, stylist has done and it will inspire me. So, some people will see my work and it will inspire them. I like, I like the fact that we're all kind of inspiring each other and we're all trying to step up the game and you know think of something new and more creative and it's just... I th yeah, I think, that's, I think that's the good thing with the, with the uh, social media side is, is not only that you sort of get to know other people around the world but you just see what they're doing and you, you take inspiration from it, don't you? Yeah. I mean it just brings, we're all bringing each other on, you know, we're all we're all sort of moving forward. We're all looking at each other's work, thinking, "Wow, that's amazing!" You know, and then and then uh, you know commenting on it, and it just it makes you feel great. Yeah. yeah, things have changed because years ago it was all about I can do this and I'm going to keep it a secret from the everything rest of the world. Everything was a secret, and now everything's sharing, yes. and people can see the benefits now of sharing rather than keeping everything secretive. You know. Yeah. You I was, I was a bit more like that. You were more open, weren't you? I was the most bit... important thing is, I mean, I, I, I do everything I do because it makes me happy. Um, it, it's, it's not for anything else other than I'm doing it, it makes me happy. And as long as I'm happy doing it, I'll keep doing it. So now, what are your dislikes and what do you believe, what changes do you believe could make the industry better? What changes do you think could enrich the industry? In closing, directed at the pair of you. I think, I think the thing I don't like about the industry at the moment is the, is the sort of ego. There's a bit of a big ego with stuff. I think, I think it's almost become a little bit like an episode of X Factor sometimes, where people think that they're going to be the, you know, that every, everybody thinks they don't go into it because they love it. They go into it because they want to be famous. It's like, it's like do what you do because you love what you do. Be passionate about what you do. Don't do it to be famous. And stay humble. And stay humble. Just do, do what you do because you love what you do. I mean, everything I do, I have to love it. I can't do something I don't love. I can't, you know, I can't sort of set a shop out unless I love the stuff I'm putting in it. And, I'm not, and I don't do it for any other reason apart from that I love it. You know, and, and then I hope, as I'm setting a shop up, I, I put what I put in it because I love the, each piece. In its own, in its own self, and then, I, and then I hope that it's going to work in the shop, you know. And and I think you do the same, don't you? You you just. I do think that I wish there'd been uh, barber licences into the industry, only because I just think that any person can just you know open up a shop uh, and start cutting. And I and I think I just think it would. You know, I just think everyone should have a license and have some sort of um, certificate of some sort to be able to open a premises. I agree with you. I think actually having licenses could actually give the trade more longevity than the way that it is at the moment. Because as you quite rightly said, anyone can open up a shop and some people are more audacious than others. You know, they could have zero talent and think, I'm going to learn on the job. And learning on the job could cause, you know, casualties. And by being casual, causes casualties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, pe people, people go and do these sort of quick fix courses. They go and get a quick sort of 
where it seems that people go and get a quick uh, qualification, and then they just come, they just they just go and open a shop somewhere, and, and literally it takes once one in our experience. I mean, we've been training people for years. In our experience, it takes once people are qualified, it still takes 12 months, dependent on their learning rate and how quickly they pick things up and maybe their artistic um, levels. It it just takes another sort of even 12 months to be a good barber, to be a good stylist, at least. And and I'm still learning now. I mean, I'm t 22 years down the line, and I you know I take. I take influence from everybody that works with me. You know, I, I, look, I look at what other people are doing. I don't claim that I created, any, you know, specifically anything in particular. I just look around and I, I see a little someone doing something, and I think that's amazing. And and it, I'm still developing them. But these guys, I mean, you know, so, some people they just get a, a qualification, spend however, however many thousands of pounds, and then they open a shop. And I hate to think what goes on. You know, the cutthroats and God. Yeah. I hear you and I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> okay then, gentlemen, because your shop is about to open. Thank you for sharing your story, your thoughts on the barbering industry on the whole. And yes, I wish you every success. Looking forward to that course that you're going to bring out. The industry is in desperate need of it if we are to take it to the next level. So thank you. Thank you Thanks, Larry. Cheers.